So I am currently at Bushy Run Battlefield, and we are actually marching down toward the site where the first shots of the battle have been fired. I probably should explain why I'm here. So, today is August 5th, 2021, which makes it the anniversary of the battle that we're about to talk about. Uh, we're not far from Jeanette PA, we're near Harrison City, Pennsylvania, and matter of fact. Uh, this site is operated, there's a small visitor center, it is open Wednesday through Sunday, I believe. Uh, they are open today. And I wanted to come on the actual anniversary date, just, just for the heck that I'm local. Uh, I'm going to be back here in a couple days for the reenactment, they'll be doing it this weekend. But I want to come when there isn't a lot of people. So, Bushy Run. Not a lot of people know about. <laughs> it's a pretty, pretty obscure conflict. Uh, it's part of Pontiac's War, sometimes called as Pontiac's Rebellion. Uh, it occurs in 1763, just at the end of the French and Indian War, which in turn is part of the Global Seven Years' War. So, very quick story on the Seven Years' War. It was a big, big conflict all around the world between all the European powers, predominantly Britain and France. And at the end of it, Britain had basically won all of the world. Yeah, they took the whole world. And to get to that point, they had to make a lot of deals with the American Indians that lived here, the Native Americans. Uh, in a particular instance, when an army marched on French-held Fort Duquesne, present-day Pittsburgh, the British general there, John Forbes, managed to negotiate some terms with several of the tribes. And the deals basically were that if you stayed west of the mountains, the Native Americans, the English would stay east of the mountains. That was the deal. There would be a buffer zone there. And these forts that they'd built to get out here, the British did, those would be used to uphold the buffer zone. Well, as it's expected with most treaties with the American Indians, it didn't last long. It didn't last long. And in, 17, and in 1763, just immediately after Fort Duquesne fell to British hands, settlers are going to start using that supply road the British Army had built called Forbes's Road. Actually, I just marched down a leg of it to get to the site. So you got uh, American settlers squatted out here in western Pennsylvania and lands that are supposed to be given back over to the American Indians in order to make sure American Indian tribes were not supporting the French. So in 1763, the tensions are going to mount. An Ottawa chief by the name of Pontiac out near Mich out of Michigan is going to start sending war belts out. Uh, he's being spurred on by a prophet who I, uh, the guide in there told me was actually his brother. I'm not fully certain on that. Uh, so this prophet was initially t uh, going around telling tribes around here, you guys need to dissolve all of your ties with the Europeans in order to, you know, live a good life. That is the gist of it. If you want to live, we need to get back to our old ideals, which are essentially just stop, stop taking the, stop taking the stuff from the Europeans. It, it never ends well for us. Pontiac took this uh, message of uh, severance into a message of war. And he is going to unite tribes into a loose confederacy with the intention of revolting against the British. They're going to start out in Fort Detroit around May of 1763. And they are very quickly going to start ambushing forts all across what is known then as the Northwest Territory. Present day Indiana, Michigan, Ohio, and Western Pennsylvania. Illinois. I forgot Illinois. And by midsummer, the rebellion is going to stretch from Detroit, where they have pinned down a British garrison, all the way to Fort Pitt. That is the British fort built over the site of Fort Duquesne in present-day Pittsburgh. There is going to be a siege. Uh, the British are going to, the commanders down there are going to send reports that there are hundreds, maybe even thousands of American Indians besieging Fort Pitt uh, with the threat of taking it. In reality, it was probably only about 100 American Indians. Uh, the American Indians were very good at guerrilla warfare. It's pretty well known. And they were able to make it appear in these wilderness, in these woods here, that they had a lot more in number than they actually did. And the fear of American Indian attack is what usually worked better than actually fighting, to be truthfully told. Colonists, uh, British soldiers, they feared. The stories are hearing about raids in, during the French Indian War. It does better than the actual scene. It's not that many, actually. Their, their numbers are pretty spaced thin. 
So they're getting these messages back in Philadelphia of all this going on out in Fort Pitt. And, uh, well, the British were in the process of removing their regular troops because the French and Indian War, the Seven Years' War, had just ended. So they were starting to evacuate them back over to Europe. So there were only a few hundred, really, they can muster up. And most of them guys, eh, they were in sick bay at the time. Uh, many of the soldiers that would fight here actually were sick with malaria. But they'd be round out of their beds because they're the only men for the job. They're going to be forced into uniform. And they are going to be put under the command of Colonel Henry Bouquet. Colonel Henry Bouquet had prior experience out here fighting in Western Pennsylvania. In fact, I'm going to change my hand. My hand is hurting. Uh, in fact, Henry Bouquet was on the Forbes campaign, that earlier mission to take Fort Duquesne that started the treaties and all this mess. He was actually out. He was actually out here, so he knew the terrain pretty well. He knew about wilderness fighting. He had experimented with using rifles amongst his regiment during Forbes's campaign. So he, he's he, he's used he's got some experience, better than most, that are still in Philadelphia at the time. So they're going to round up these men out of sick bay, they're going to get them all uniformed, and they're going to start marching. And when I mean marching, I mean they are going forced march day and night across Forbes' road. Now before this road had been built, it would probably taken us several weeks, maybe even a, a little more than a month to get them through the wilderness. But now it's only going to take about two to three weeks to really get across the colony, showing how important this new line of communication was. But these men are sick, and about at every fort, they're dropping 30 of their sickest men off. So by the time he gets to Fort Ligonier, which is only about 20 miles to the east of us, he is going to only have about 400 men to advance on Fort Pitt. To quicken his pace, he is going to offload most of his supplies, load them onto pack horses, make the men carry some supplies, and make sick men carry supplies. I don't let them well. And try to hurry. Maybe just in two or three, two days, they can march upon Fort Pitt. Well, on August 5th, his mission, Henry Bouquet's mission, is to get his British column of 400 men to a trading post called Bushy Run. It's about a mile to the west of here. The resupply on desperately needed water. The American Indians, of course, knew this land very well. And prior to, the, uh, prior to for, uh, Bouquet making his advance here, they had already staged an ambush. In fact, they actually informed one of the settlers out here to evacuate because there was going to be some, some uh, intense fighting about to occur here. So on August 5th, about 1 o'clock, they would have been coming down that road over there, right, that road behind me. So at about 1 o'clock on August 5th, 1763, Bouquet's 400 men would have been marching down through the woods, down this leg of Forbes' road. And it should be noted that this was not actually the original road built when the British attacked Fort Duquesne. This was a later fork added. And they're coming between those two trees. That's roughly the trace of Forbes' road. And where I'm standing in this farm field, this would have been nothing but wilderness. Thick, virgin timber. We're talking about six men to link hands wrap around the trunk of one of these trees. So use your imagination. Right about here, the road will fork up that way over the hill. Now, from this hillside and from the ravine around us, the American Indians are going to launch their ambush. Somewhere up there along the hills where the first shots could be fired. Uh, the army is in, uh, for, uh, for, Bouquet's army is marching in an L formation, stretching from down here and then veering up here at a right angle. They are going to form battle lines and start returning fire. And how this opening de battle develops, the American Indians have about 100 guys, but they're able to move a lot quicker around Bouquet's 400 men. So they're going to pop out of brush, disappear, move a few feet, fire up and down, really giving the illusion of the British that there's more of them. And again, as I mentioned, that is part of the strategy, more to terrify them and instill fear than actually revealing their true numbers. Every time the American Indians make a rush upon the line here, Bouquet is going to be able to drive them back. And Bouquet's army was uh, consisted of Highlanders from Scotland, Royal Americans from Germany, as well as some American uh, Rangers. Uh, they were there to uh, keep the flanks of the army in check. So they're going to be... So somebody comes running down, the American Indians come running. Bouquet is going to launch a counterattack, and he is able to keep the American Indians at bay, but only for so long. Again, these men are sickly; they're wearing wool uniforms, and on a day today is actually a little 
little bit humid, but fairly pleasant. But if you can imagine being in the trees and you get the humidity and the moisture all build up, yeah, it, you're, you're not going to last too long. And Bouquet knows this. And by late in the day, he has lost about 60 men, killed or wounded or missing. He has to make a decision. He's going to get massacred if he keeps the fighting down here. So he is going to retreat. Now we are in retreat with Bouquet's force, retreating from the site of August 5th's first actions. And we are going to march up this, quite honestly, pretty steep slope, especially if you consider, suffered from malaria, just fought a big battle. You know, you're gonna be tired. They're gonna march up what is known as Edge Hill, and they're gonna come up and build a temporary redoubt. Hey, look, by the name for the YouTube channel, Redoubt Productions. Wonder where I got that from. So they're gonna come up here and they're gonna build a redoubt out of the flour sacks they've been bringing with them. Remember how I mentioned how they had offloaded all their supplies at Fort Ligonier to quicken their haste? Well, now they're gonna get it used, but not for eating. It's gonna be used to save their lives the night of August 5th. Bouquet retreats up here and he builds a redoubt out of flour sacks. I mentioned that coming up the climb. Can't remember, it's pretty hot today. He's gonna build in, we don't know the exact size of the redoubt, but if I had to take a guess, it probably wasn't massive. Uh, I'd have to guess it probably, the wall would be, my finger come in view. My wa the wall would be probably about here if I had to guess. It wasn't probably that big. Uh, not only was there flower sacks involved in building the wall, he also is gonna throw in, I think he's gonna overturn some wagons to be involved with it. Uh, dead horses are gonna be included in it. He's going to lean the wounded up against the flower sacks to give him a little bit of respite. And from there, he's basically stuck out here. He is surrounded on three sides. He can retreat back to Fort Ligonier. The rear is open, but that is a common native uh, tactic. To try to have the enemy retreat and then ambush them on the way back. Uh, for those that might be familiar with the Battle of Fort William Henry in 1757, during their retreat, let, uh, there was a massacre, which was blown out of proportion in the last Mohegans, but we won't talk about that. Great movie. Anyways, back to Bushy Rock. So, Bouquet manages to get out of correspondence back to Fort Ligonier. It's assigned to Jeffrey Amherst, commander of North America. And it's not very optimistic. Uh, he lists how badly in need of war they are. He lists how high casualties they've had. And he, at the end, basically says, I hope this gets out to you. I don't think you're going to hear from me again. We'll see what happens. So that was the mindset of the commander on the night of August 5th, going into August 6th. He, these guys were expecting to meet their end. And Bouquet is going to have to do something drastically different to previous battles like this in order to get out of here alive. It's the perspective that the American Indians would have had facing Ed Chill the night of August 5th into the 6th. We're looking toward the northeastern side of the hill. Morning light on August 5th brought new attacks from the natives. The British continued to suffer casualties and Bouquet realized he could not hold his position. The natives had surround the British on three sides. So Bouquet devised a plan to withdraw troops from the front line in what would appear to be a British retreat. Part of the force withdrew behind Edge Hill, reforming into a fighting formation. They moved along the hill to strike the flank of the natives, who had rushed to attack the weakened British front. The plan worked and surprised the natives, who had been repulsed by the main body of troops and fled in the front of the supporting gunfire. Unaccustomed to suffering large casualties, the natives quickly withdrew, leaving the British in control of the field. I don't know how Bouquet and some of the British would feel that the battlefield that is dedicated to them is uh, flying an American flag right over the site of their supposed of their triumph. Uh, yeah. Um, so we came back to the so some Indians came back to the battlefield and started stripping stripping the Highlanders. Scouts, you know, scalping some of them. And they ran back up to Fort Pitt. They started parading the, parading the, the kills and, yeah, the, the scouts and the trophies. I believe sometime in the 1930s is when this marker was installed. It's made out of Ligonier bluestone from one of the Ligonier quarries. Difficulty, there's 
British will break off their pursuit after a two-mile running battle. Bouquet had to very quickly reorganize his exhausted troops. He ordered most of the supplies burn on Edge Hill and then made a hasty march to the Bushy Run trading post, which they found burned down. Fortunately, they were still able to get water. The army would ultimately arrive on August 10th, 1763 at Fort Pitt, but by then the American Indians had already given up on the siege. In fact, most of the attack force at Bushy Run were the same group that had been besieging Fort Pitt for the prior months. The battle exhausted the American Indians' supplies and their ammunition. Now, this trail I'm walking on, I head back to the museum, is uh, not part of the actual battlefield. We're actually behind, this is actually the backside of Edge Hill. But since most of the battlefield has been deforested, this gives you more of an idea of what you would have been dealing with in the 1760s. Now that we're here in the AC in the museum, we're going to take a look at some of the artifacts around here. I encourage you to visit the actual site to see the full museum. So there's a sign down here that's listing some, just some of the items one of the regiments here, the 77th Highlanders, lost the battle. Uh, they were packing light coming here into battle because they had to rush across Pennsylvania to relieve Fort Pitt. But they still had a good bit of accoutrements on, as you can see by this mannequin here. And just here is a short list, and they had at least 12 sergeants' plaids. That's this over here. The plaids were missing. 23 privates' plaids were gone. Over 100 shirts were lost. 47 pairs of shoes were lost. 21 neck stocks, 8 neck rollers, 8 jackets, 23 knapsacks, 17 haversacks, 8 kettles, 23 tumpa lines, and that's the material you see here, the tumpa lines, and at least 6 wooden kegs. <laughs> Boy, somebody had to pay for that. Hmm, I wonder who paid for that in a form of taxation. So during these frontier fightings, like in the French and Indian War and Pontiac's Rebellion, you basically had, at least amongst the British, two different ways of loading your firearm. There was the military fashion of the cartridge box with rolled cartridges of powder and musket ball all in one, and that was supposed to make it a bit of a quicker process to load. But many people, colonists living on the frontier, had adopted some of the stuff from the American Indians, which was you had a powder horn for all of your black powder, and then you had the shot pouch down here with your musket ball. So instead of it being in a single tube, you divide it between two different carrying packages. I know during the Forbes campaign, initially they tried to outlaw these. Uh, they tried to encourage the American provincials to use the cartridge system, but they were so bad at rolling cartridges that the general just kind of gave up and was like, fine, go get your powder horns and shot pouches from your homes. So yeah, two different styles of loading your firearm. Now, these are reproductions, but I've never seen something like this before. Uh, these are ties and halters used on prisoners when Native Americans would raid the frontier and take colonists captive. Pretty cool, never got to see something like that. Created by James Blake, these repros. Probably the most infamous event of Pontiac's Rebellion has to be the smallpox blankets. At Fort Pitt, the garrison gave out infected blankets to American Indians that were besieging Fort Pitt. Uh, There's some controversy over who made the actual ruling, if it was Amherst or if it was Bouquet or somebody else. It's unsure what the effect of it was, but some consider it the first use of biological warfare. Side, I talked about Forbes's road and it being built a few years earlier. Here's some tools showing you uh, tools they would use to build roads like that, wilderness roads. We're talking nothing more than a dirt trail through the wilderness, but it's much better than nothing. Tallying up both sides, about anywhere from 50 to 100 men were killed at the Battle of Bushy Run. The significance of this battle can be seen in different ways. You have these pattern set of westward expansion colliding with the remains of American Indian cultures, and that's going to lead into the Indian Wars well into the 19th and early 20th centuries. You also have the fact that before this war, the British military were getting ready to leave North America, leave it alone, get it back to its older pre-war times. Now, with the constant threat 
of Indian raids. You're going to have a constant military presence in cities like Boston, which Americans are going to be none too enthused with. And as I alluded to earlier, all the costs of this war, like Pontiac's rebellion and the French Indian War, all these supplies are going to add up, and the Americans are going to be the ones to pay for it in taxes. And we all know where that's going to lead to. So this was a bit of a more rambly video than I normally do. I just want to get my thoughts while I was here on location, explain what I thought about the site. If you want to see a more concisive account of this battle, check out my construction paper battlefield episode on the Battle of Bushu Run. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.